no race owns a specific category or industry. I sometimes feel the ignorance is when people realize I own a champagne brand and then they think, well, how'd you get into it? You know, like, obviously, because I don't look like I belong to it, right? Looks can be deceiving. You never know what somebody does own or participate in based on just you looking at them. So sometimes it's always good to like always have an open mind. I always believe in having an open mind because you never know what, who, what, where, and why or how. That was Marvina Robinson, founder of B. Stuyvesant Champagne, and this is Epicenter NYC. We connect our communities to news, information, and each other. I'm your host, Amber Castillo. In her 20s, Marvina Robinson and her friends would sip champagne from red plastic cups on bed stoops. Inspired by music videos, they indulged in the elegance of champagne. Two decades later, Marvina is one of the few Black women entrepreneurs in the champagne industry. She left her career on Wall Street to follow her passion, establishing B. Stuyvesant Champagne in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Marvina's journey took her to Champagne, France, where she immersed herself in the culture and built a partnership with a vineyard owner. Now, back in Brooklyn, she brings a fresh perspective to a wine synonymous with luxury. It's not just for special occasions. Instead, it can be enjoyed with everyday meals. Today, I sit down with Marvina to explore her journey in starting B. Stuyvesant Champagne, the challenges she faced along the way, and how her background in finance, along with an education in statistics and entrepreneurship, helped her overcome these hurdles. She also shares insights on balancing growth and self-care. Before we jump in, a quick message from our team. Hi, I'm Carolina from the Epicenter NYC team, here to remind you to safeguard your fun, your plans, and your trips. Get vaccinated and don't let illness cancel your joy. It's your season, not flu season, not COVID season. You can schedule your appointment now and we can help. Send us a note at hello at epicenter-nyc.com or call or text us at 917-818-2690. Now back to my conversation with Marvina. Hi, my name is Marvina Robinson. I am the founder and CEO of Beast Iverson Champagne. And could you take us through the story of how it began and, and when you knew that you wanted to make, that, that you wanted to have a champagne business? Oh my goodness. So that goes back way back. So we publicly launched in February of 2020, but I was working on the brand as a hobby years leading up to that. So backstory about myself is I worked on in finance on Wall Street for 20 years, and I really just love champagne. So I used to gift some clients and some coworkers. That was my gift of choice to people. And I would just look for unique bottles, right? We can all get the big houses. Those are easy to get, but I would research grow a champagne, smaller houses, research them, give them with tasting notes, more about the vineyard, how to appear to really educate some of my friends about champagne, but just being really intentional with my gift. And then that just drew a deeper research for me because I would travel back and forth to France to find out more about champagne. Champagne can only come from champagne. It's in the champagne region of France using certain grapes and a whole bunch of other different rules, you know, that the champagne committee that oversees the champagne industry has implemented, which has gone on for centuries. And I always think the best way to learn is more about immersing yourself in the culture. So that's basically what I did. When did you first go to Champagne? When did you first go to that part of France? I would say my first time to Champagne, France was probably in 2014, 13, long time ago. Um, and then I intensely began picking up and I just started researching it and I love it. And I go to Champagne on a frequent basis. And what brought you there in the first place? Um, I just was curious. You know, I, I travel a lot and we used to go to, uh, I used to go to London, but I was always curious about Champagne. And one time I just said, let me just go over there. And it took me a little time to figure out when I wanted to be consistent. And then I just started going over on a consistent basis. And then I started researching for my brand. And then the brand ended up, you know, developing. It was perfect for me. I'm like Dora the Explorer. Like I have no problem in just going out researching. I love to travel. So that's where it all originated from. And could you talk about your first experience with, you know, drinking champagne? My first experience was probably in my 20s with my two childhood friends who I'm really close with now. And I was the only one that went to a different school. I went to Norfolk State. 
And we would come home, meet up, and we would kind of sh- do what they do in the videos, drinking champagne, and we would pull our money together. We were broke college students. I would just, um, you know, we'll just have fun together. We'll pull our money together, get plastic cups. We're all from Brooklyn Breakfast Stuyvesant, and we would sit on the stoop and just sip bottles. You know, it was just like, oh, we're we're grown young women. We're we're in school, or we had summer jobs, and we would pull our money together and be like, oh, okay, let's get a bottle and. We could all really only afford one bottle. So, yeah. <laughs> so besides, you know, it, uh, drinking champagne being like those kinds of scenes that you would see in the music videos, um, what did champagne represent for you? Because often we see champagne as like a form of like celebration. And I'm wondering what that means to you. Um, well, when I think of champagne, I think champagne has no gender, right? I think that if you, everyone has different price points. And you feel what's right for you. That's number one. I don't think champagne is just for celebrations. It's a myth. Champagne can be paired with everyday meals. It can be paired through a seven-course tasting menu, right? It's it's more about enjoying the wine. Champagne is a wine. It just happens to be a type of wine and just happens to be bubbles. And there's so many different tasting profiles that you can draw from it. And that's why I always inform people that they should explore it, you know, do your own tastings and taste a cava versus a Prosecco versus a champagne and see what your palate drives you, right? Put them in a brown paper bag, cover it up so you don't know what you're drinking, mix it up. And then you friends as as friends, see what it tastes like and you can draw your own opinion. Um, But you'll be able to taste the difference. I guarantee you it. And that's one of the things how I look at champagne. And that's what I describe to my, my consumers if I'm talking to people about it. I'm like, it's more about just doing your own exploring. So you don't think I'm talking fluff or, you know, when you read different articles, you'll taste the difference. And people will say, you know, depending on which cuvee it is. And also remembering everybody's palate is unique. So what I like, you may not like. And it's a difference. And as, as champagne is characterized on dosage and dosage is sugar, sugar levels. You might like it a little bit sweeter, which might be a demisec. You might like it less sweeter, which might be a brute or, you know, an extra brute. So those are things that I, I kind of share my view, visions about champagne. And when you say champagne has no gender, that means it has no, like, has no race, ethnicity, class. It's like a white t-shirt. If you want to wear a white t-shirt, you wear a white t-shirt. You have different types of white t-shirts, right? You have some from Fruit of the Loom. You have the Gap. You have James Purse, you have uh, Alexander McQueen, a Gucci t-shirt. So just different levels of what you feel comfortable with and what you want to explore. When you talk about like, you know, just testing something like what is it like for you or like kind of that taste profile, when did you start and how did you start developing that? I mean, I just started sipping champagne and I just started doing different types of champagne and I just wanted to know more because I would go into a store and I would see these different price tags and I want to know what's driving these price tags. And of course, you want to drink what's popular, right? You'll go to what you know or what's being heavenly pushed. But then one time I had, I went, I remember I went to a dinner party in my younger years when I was just starting on my career and we had this champagne and I'm like, oh my God, this is so good. And it just made me want to say like, I had to go figure out what the, what the bottle was. But then I wanted to say like, wow, I was only drinking this. And this, I guess, something totally different. And that's when I just started doing my own independent research. And then back to your um, to the journey of this business. So you were working in, in Wall Street, you said, for like 20 years. At what point did you realize, like when you were, I know you were giving, um, you know, out samples to, to clients. At what point did you realize, like, this could be a business or I want this to be a business? Well, I wanted to open up a small champagne bar highlighting these amazing growers brand. And no big houses unless they were like vintages. And I wanted a house brand. So B. Stuyvesant was originally supposed to be the house champagne for the bar. COVID came, things took a turn, and then the champagne became the business. And then it took off faster than I expected. So then I just kind of like curved to where we, we were going. And I just made the champagne the business. And now we have like a beautiful um, tasting room in the Brooklyn Navy Yard where guests and customers can make their own reservations online. They can come in and explore champagnes. Can you talk about any um, 
inspirations you had and anything that inspired that vision? Or was it like once you got on that journey of like champagne tasting? I mean, I just envisioned how I would want to learn about champagne or the different environments that I didn't have. And it's more about, again, being intentional, doing the the labor and saying, okay, this is perfect for what I want to do. And I have a very visionary mind. I can say, I know what I want to do and I just bring it to life. And that's like everybody's imagination, right? If you want to do something, you figure it out in your head and you figure out what steps are needed to build this, whether it's a brand or a project or whatever you're working on, and you slowly begin to implement. And that's really what I did. You know, I knew what the end product I wanted to do, which is I wanted to have a house champagne and I worked backwards to get there. Could you talk through some of those um, steps or like some of the, you know, maybe challenging facets of getting there? One, you have to find a vineyard that wants to work with you, right? I don't own the vineyard. I partner with one vineyard exclusively that produces for me only. That's the hard part. So, and that's more about building relationships. I mean, me going back and forth to friends for years, you know, I kind of, you know, began to build relationships and talk to people that I trust. I just wasn't embarging on somebody's territory and just say, hey, make this for me. It's about building and becoming, you know, more educated about it. And that's where it all started. Challenges is find a vineyard. Challenges is, you know, I'm not French. Um, I don't speak fluent French. I do use Google Translator. But those shouldn't be challenges to stop you, right? No race owns a specific category or industry. So that's one thing. And and. I sometimes feel the ignorance is when people realize I own a champagne brand and then they think, well, how'd you get into it? You know, like, obviously, because I don't look like I belong to it, right? Looks can be deceiving. You never know what somebody does own or participate in based on just you looking at them. So sometimes it's always good to like always have an open mind. I always believe in having an open mind because you never know what, who, what, where, and why, or how. How did you, you know, speaking of building relationships, what was that like with this particular um, seller or like a vineyard? I mean, it was more about like, it just happens naturally and organically over years. I did not have this plan. This was just me living my life and enjoying what I love to do. So I think the brand kind of, the brand is a, a, a labor of love, right? I love champagne. This is what I like to do. Naturally, there's challenges and steps along the way, importing, uh, you know, abiding by all the different laws from international to also within the U.S. It's a process, but it's about a labor of love. Like I have people say, oh, I want to open my own champagne. I want to do this. I don't have a step-by-step manual. What everything I've done was based on everything that I was going through at that time. And if I had roadblocks, I would just have to figure out a solution. I never said, okay, this is what we're going to do. Because no situation, anything you do is alike. Was there anything from your, um, from your career in Wall Street that you think, you know, helped you? I mean, I think everything's a building portion. Build, everything I do, I try to make an experience. And having a, working in finance Wall Street is a very intense career very sharp, very have to have a good mindset. And I think I just took those skill sets and I just transferred them over to my own business. You know, you think about problem solving, you think about being able to juggle multiple tasks, project management, execution, finding out, researching before you put a plan in motion. All of that comes into play that can roll into any industry. I don't care if you work in Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, Popeye's, you have skill sets and traits you can take from there to continue to build on your own business. Was there a moment or a specific like problem that you had to problem solve for um, in this business? I mean, everything's a problem being an entrepreneur, right? Whether it's importing, whether it's w- wine labels, whether it's personalizing champagne foils, corks, wire cages, boxes, all of that stuff is a problem because it's your first time you're doing it. You don't know what's going to work for you or what's not. So every step of the process, even getting here to the States, what's my storage? How are we shipping boxes? How are we getting licenses to ship? Everything had its own issue. And when you just have to problem solve as they pop up. And what, so that was setting up the business. Is there a, you know, a greatest challenge that you have now in the business? I mean, I have challenges every day. I have staffing challenges. I have catering to consumers. Being in a consumer focused business, it's, it's not for the week. So all of that actually comes into play when I'm, you know, working everyday life or we have 
requests with some of our clients. They want to put together these whimsical things. And it's like myself and my team's responsibility to figure out how to bring their thoughts to life. What what brings you the most joy? Uh, when I see people with the product and they or I, sometimes I'm walking somewhere or they're like, oh, you know, I love your champagne. Stuff like that. Or it makes me happy when people gift it or when I see the end product to production, in production. And what about your friends that you would have champagne like with back in the day? Oh, we still drink together. Those are my girls. We are still friends. We have been friends since we were in single numbers and we are well into our 40s, each living different independently lives with families, kids. And it's a blessing um, to have that um, experience, you know. And, you know, what um, what are your hopes for the future of the business? Um, I want to continue to scale the business, you know, scale, grow and tap into other markets. And finally, like, what does it mean for you to be a small business owner? I mean, a small business owner is it's a lot, right? You're responsible for everything. And it is a lot of work. It is not pretty. But you also still have to make time for yourself because you're always on and you're responsible for everything. If staff calls out, you're responsible for everything. And it's a challenge to also balance personal life, life outside of work. And sometimes I just need to break from talking about champagne. Like when we go out with my friends, I'd be like, I don't want to talk about no champagne. We can drink it, but I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about business. I want to have fun with my friends and that's it. And I think that's the, the thing to being a small business owner, but also embracing, you know, knowing that this small business won't be small forever. And it said that it's a life is like a box of chocolates, right? You never know what's in it, like Forrest and Forrest Gump movie. What I say is like if you think it, you if you think it, you can achieve it. And for people who have goals and just make sure they go out and achieve them. You know, don't take no as an answer and just find w- ways around your your blockers. And where should people find you if they want to know more about your business? So our Instagram and Facebook handle is Stuyvesant Champagne. Our website is StuyvesantChampagne.com. Um, and we interactive on both and also through our website. You can subscribe to our website and we send out a monthly newsletter. B. Stuyvesant Champagne is located at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in Building 3, Suite 606 on the 6th floor. They're open Monday through Thursday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. and Friday from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. You can also just stay up to date by following them on Instagram at Stuyvesant Champagne or by visiting stuyvesantchampagne.com. You can find all of these links in our show notes. Finally, if you know a local business that you think Epicenter should feature, let us know. Drop us a note at hello at epicenter-nyc.com. That's all for today. Thanks for listening and thanks for supporting us as we do our best to support our community. We couldn't do it without you. For more stories like this, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at epicenter-nyc.com. Our intro music is All the Pretty Horses by Caravica. You can find more of their music on their website linked to in our podcast description. 